Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to go ahead and thank you for attending this webinar focused on accessible beekeeping. I am Shelby Thomas, the Communication and Engagement Specialist for the Florida AgriBility, and I'll serve as your moderator for today. Just a few housekeeping items. We are being recorded, so bear that in mind. Um, and in respect for our presenters, as they are presenting, if you will just keep yourself muted, um, that would be ideal for during the presentation session. At the end of the presentation, we'll offer an opportunity for a question and answer session, um, which will uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you have come up within the webinar. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. And we will attempt to answer any questions that come through, and we'll do as many as possible. The contact information for our uh, presenters today will be provided at the end of the webinar so that you have the ability to contact them if there are any further questions. Just a little bit about Florida AgriBility before we get started. Uh, this program is a partnership between the University of Florida IFAS Extension and the Center for Independent Living of North Central Florida. AgriBility is a program sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture that aids farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural workers and farm family members living with a disability. The main objective of this project is to assist farmers in overcoming barriers caused by disabilities and health conditions to continue farming. Um, to learn more about us, we do encourage you to visit our website. We'll drop our link along with a few other helpful resources in the chat at the end of the webinar. So before you log off, be sure to check the chat. Um, and now I would, it would be my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the day. Danny Boast is the District 1 representative for the Florida State Beekeepers Association and recent president of his local beekeepers association. He's been a beekeeper since 2019 and works in honeybee preservation and promoting beekeeping in this area. I will be sharing, like I said, his email at the end and um, you'll have access to that as well. And Lindsay Head <clears throat> has been working with the Florida AgriBility Project as a case coordinator for over a year. Before coming on board, she worked as a trial manager for the UF IFAS Agronomy Department, where she planted, harvested, and conducted research on several crop trials. Lindsay is a graduate of Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College with one bachelor's degree in agribusiness and one in livestock production. She thoroughly enjoys working with AgriBility and is passionate about assisting farmers with disabilities. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Lindsay. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to first apologize. Um, I have come down with the sickness this week. So if I um, start coughing a little bit or I mute myself. I do apologize. I'm going to try and power through. And if I have to hand it over to Shelby, if I get into a coughing fit, I apologize. But like I said, I'm, I'm going to try my best to power through. So I'm also going to stop my video while I'm presenting. And then at the end for q and I will turn it back on. And let's get started. All right, so here are some statistics to give you guys um, an overview of the Florida agriculture industry. Um, the average age of farmers in Florida are 58.9 years old, so almost 60. 37% of the ag producers in Florida are 65 and older. 14% of the total population of farmers are veterans. 31% of Florida's agricultural producers have 10 or fewer years farming. And per USDA, that is actually considered to be a beginning farmer. So if you see things such as beginning farmer programs or loans, this is referring to farmers that have been farming for 10 years or fewer. The majority of the labor force um, are Hispanic farm workers. And the estimated number of individuals affected by disability in ag is 18,900. Now, Personally, I think this number is higher only because um, from working with farmers this past year, I'm learning um, 
there's a large stigma around saying something is a disability. So we classify disability as anything from arthritis to spinal cord to, to bad knees and a bad back. Personally, I don't know a farmer that doesn't struggle with at least one of these. So I would suspect this number is a lot higher. All right, this is some more statistics on um, farms and kind of different ag sectors in Florida. So as of 2022, there are 47,300 farms in Florida, 9.7 million acres of production, and the average farm size was roughly 205 acres. In 2021, Florida ranked first in floriculture, sugarcane, beans, cucumbers, fresh market tomatoes, and watermelons, second in cabbage, oranges, strawberries, fresh market sweet corn, grapefruit, peppers, and third in peanuts. Um, Florida beekeeping is actually becoming pretty booming, hence our accessible beekeeping webinar we're having today. But um, currently there are 5, 000, more than 5,000 registered beekeepers and over 650,000 managed colonies in Florida at this time, which is awesome. So this is a map of the um, state agribility projects that are funded. Um, currently there are 21 states that are funded. This map is not up um, to current. So California has gained funding. I believe North Dakota has gained funding and unfortunately North Carolina has lost funding, but these are all states that agribility um, is funded from the USDA. Affiliate projects, which are the lighter gray, they have some sort of um, assisted technology program in place for farmers, but they are not funded by the USDA. Um, hopefully we will have an updated map on the national website in the near future. So if you have any friends or family in any of these states, please feel free to let them know that are farmers or interested in farming or even veterans, um, please let them know about agribility. So just to touch back up on that, the USDA funded this partnership program and it's a partnership between UF IFIS and the Center for Independent Living of North Central Florida. We assist farmers and farm workers with disability, illness, injury, or impairment to continue working safely in agriculture. And if you go on our website and go to About Agribility, it will give you a better list and idea of what we consider to be eligible. All right, so these are our main services and priorities education, networking, direct assistance, and marketing. For education, we hold webinars um, like this one, workshops, and provide resource development. For networking, um, we leverage efforts with other groups. We really, really prioritize this. Um, there's a huge advantage to establishing great partnerships and working together to best serve clients. For example, USDA staff members relay information to us regarding hurricane disaster assistance programs, and then we share that information to clients and on our social platforms. We really, really prioritize working with other groups and stakeholders to continue to help clients and future clients or anyone in the ag industry at that. So direct assistance, that is um, my main component in the program. So we provide free direct assistance to um, farmers that are interested in enrolling with agribility. We provide consultations, site assessments, AT recommendations, and financial resources. So to give you guys a quick run through of how that process would work, if a farmer reaches out to me, either through the website or social media or the agribility phone number that's on the website, I would have a consultation with them and see what their needs are. Some may only need a resource, excuse me, very quick while I cough, <laughs> excuse me, um, educational resources, business planning, or financial resources, or if they have a farm, they may need a site assessment. So at a site assessment, I would go to their farm. I would look at their, their, um, their tractors, their implements, the size of their farms, what their production is. I would kind of see what their physical hindrances are as they are just naturally moving around their farm. And then we would begin to work together to put a case together for them to um, either get them the technology they need or modifications and help them find financial resources as well. Um, for marketing, 
um, public awareness activities and materials. We also attend a lot of fairs, expos. Our wonderful Shelby puts together a lot of great outreach materials and also keeps our social media up to date. So as far as the financial resources, this is probably one of the biggest questions we get. Under most circumstances, we cannot provide direct funding or equipment. We assist seeking through vocational rehabilitation or other grants and loans. Um, examples of other grants and loans would be things specifically for beginning farmers or um, veteran grants or loans like um, independence fund or something of that nature. There are some some um, niche loans that are just for certain sectors of people in the um, ag industry. So for example, uh, we have been able to provide direct equipment to farmers through special situations. We had um, a fundraiser through the Center for Independent Living last year, and we raised some money from the program, and we were able to distribute around $5,000 of equipment to our farmers last year, but that directly from the Florida Agribility Program. But like we say, that is not always the situation. We will almost always try to go through vocational rehabilitation. <clears throat> and now I will turn it over to Danny. Hello, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say happy Veterans Day to all our veterans attending the uh, the webinar today. Uh, from one veteran to another, I know the sacrifices you had to make during your career, and I thank you. So let's talk about pollination a little bit. Pollination is the movement of pollen from male plants of a flower to a female part of the, of the same or different flower. This movement of pollen leads to the fertilization of plants, which can result in the production of seeds and fruits. Uh, pollen can be moved by a, 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 abiotic, uh, non-living factors such as wind or water, or pollen can be moved by living organisms like bees, butterflies, birds, bats, to just to name a few. This pollination of plants is really important for both our food systems and the natural environment. A quarter to a third of our global food crops rely on animal pollinators to some degree, while nearly all or 94% uh, of wildflowering plants depend on insect pollination. A really great illustration of this can be found in a study that was conducted in 2009 in which researchers studied 100 globally important crops that are produced to feed people around the world. They placed these 100 crops into 10 different categories. The categories uh, were considered were cereal crops such as wheat, uh, fruits, legumes like beans and peas, edible oils, nuts, spices, stimulant crops including coffee and chocolate, vegetables, roots and tubers, and sugar crops. The researchers of this study found that 46 of those crops that they considered spanning seven of the crop categories or dependent on bee pollination to some degree. So the production of fruits, legumes, oils, nuts, spices, coffee, and chocolate, and vegetables all rely on bees. These crops are generally considered, considered specialty crops, and they make up about 39% of the value of food uh, production globally. In addition, the researchers found that without any bees at all, three of the crop categories would uh, quickly fall below consumption levels. Those important crops include fruits, vegetables, and stimulant crops. So while we would not starve without bees, our diets would quickly become bland, nutritionally deficient without bees or other pollinators. A great example of how beekeepers assist in pollination efforts can be seen if you look at the transportation routes in the United States. Uh, for commercial beekeepers with hundreds to thousands of honeybee colonies, it is their job to move honeybees around the country uh, wherever they are needed most. So a commercial beekeeper may take their bees from, uh, from Florida, move them to California to pollinate almonds, then to Michigan to pol uh, pollinate cherries, then return uh, the bees to Florida to overwinter them and pollinate blueberries in the early spring. An example of how beekeepers contribute to the economy, let's look at some of the 2021 statistics. Honeybee population uh, pollination led to $15 billion of annual value from increased field and quality of crops in the U.S. When looking at honey, 126 million pounds of honey was produced with a value of $310 million. 
And in Florida alone, commercial beekeepers produced uh, approximately 8.8 .8 million pounds of honey with a value of $19.8 million. So honeybees are certainly uh, economically valuable to a commercial scale. At one point that these amounts do not include honey produced or sold by local backyard or hobbyist beekeepers, which could provide considerable income to those individuals. So now we understand honeybees are important and can provide economic value. How can it help individuals with disabilities? Surprisingly, accessible beekeeping is not a, a new trend. In 1919, as troops returned from World War I, the federal government began recommending beekeeping as a profession for soldiers, especially disabled veterans. Still today, organizations provide combat veterans with honeybees, equipment, beekeeping training as a means to cope with PTSD. The process of managing honeybees along with how to adapt to them as described in the April 1919 manual still exists today. Individuals with disabilities still must improvise, use assistive technology, and arrange their apiaries to meet their specific individual needs. As our understanding of how to manage honeybees advance, so does our assistive technology. Apiary maintenance involves a yearly uh, cycle of feeding, adjusting hive components, making repairs, harvesting honey, and winterizing your hives. Here is just a few basic uh, beekeeping tasks you will be required to perform as a beekeeper. Successful beekeepers inspect their hives regularly for bee health, pest, and honey production. While performing these tasks, a, bee a beekeeper may be required to travel across rough terrain to their hives, unstacked and stacked hive bodies weighing up to 90 pounds, and pry free and pull out frames. The challenge of mobility and physical strain of inspecting hives reduces the willpower to do so and could lead to failure of the apiary. Common physical challenges faced by beekeepers are repetitive movement injuries, arthritis, back injury from bending over and lifting hive bodies, and carpal tunnel syndrome caused by grasping and gripping the hive bodies and frames and hive tools. Ergonomic principles are especially important to help overcome beekeeping physical challenges. Resting in regular uh, intervals, alternating tasks, storing items below shoulder level and within reach, and using proper lifting and carrying techniques will help prevent injuries. So what exactly is assistive technology and how can it help you as a beekeeper? The World Health Organization states assistive technology enables people to live healthy, productive, independent, and dignified lives and to participate in education, the labor market, and civic life. We just simply stated that assistive technology is an item that improves the functional capabilities of a person with a disability. Now, throughout our presentation so far, you've heard us mention hives and hive bodies uh, during this. The hive body is a series of boxes and components stacked together. Frames are inserted into the boxes where they hang down for the bees to raise brood or store honey. Shown here is a typical Langstroth hive most beekeepers use in their apiaries. Starting from the top or from the bottom to the top, we will discuss the purpose of each of the components. The hive stand can, uh, can consist of anything from a wooden platform as shown, to cinder blocks lifting the hive components off the ground. You can get as, as fancy as you want to at this level. The bottom board is the base of the hive and provides a means for the bees to gain access into the hive. The queen excluder or honey excluder to some ensures the queen is maintained in the brood box where she lays her eggs. Both the brood box and the supers will be discussed in the next slide. So we'll move to the inner cover which provides bee space between the top super and the outer cover and allows for ventilation of the hive. The telescoping outer cover provides a protective cover for from uh, increment weather. So now the lower deep boxes, which is nine to five inches is high or brood box is where the honeybees store pollen and honey to assist with the raising of the brood. These boxes can weigh up to 80 pounds when full the upper mediums boxes are six to five eighths inches or honey supers is where the honeybees store excess honey not required within the brood box. This is the honey beekeepers harvest either for personal use or just uh, through sale. 
Another smaller, although smaller, they can still weigh up to 65 pounds when completely filled with honey. Now the shallow hive boxes, five and three quarters inches, also called a honey super, can weigh up to 40 pounds when completely filled with honey. So the most basic assistive technology for lifting hive components is to use smaller hive bodies. A study of uh, grape harvest workers found that decreasing harvest tub size from 57 to 46 pounds reduced muscular skeletal injuries by 50%. Using small hive bodies will have the same impact. Uh, this will include uh, will require some supers and frames to uh, gather all the honey, but the health benefits are significant. Uh, another way to reduce the lifting weight of the hive bodies is to use an eight frame hive instead of a 10 frame. Uh, these bodies are narrower and thus hold less honey, but easier to lift. Uh, Dr. Adam Ingrero from the Michigan State University Heroes to Hives program recommends eight frame equipment for all veterans he worked with with dealing with uh, either a back, neck, knee, or ankle injury. Now, the length of hive discussed during this presentation is not the only hive that's available. Uh, we also have the horizontal hives or the Slovenian AZ hive, which may suit your individual needs. Both of those could be worked uh, whilst in a seated position. Moving hives is also a, a difficult piece right here. So whole hive lifts are simple and less costly, but they are limited to their usefulness. Whole hive lifts require a ramp to load hives onto a trailer because they simply tilt and roll. Uh, we've seen these used for refrigerators, washing machines, anything as any, anybody's moved into their homes. A heavy duty, long plate, two wheel uh, dolly with wide all terrain tires can be used to move a whole hives. A two person hive lift has handles on both sides and tabs that catch on the hive body hand grips. Although it is typically used to lift whole hives by adding a strap as shown, it can move individual hive bodies depending on what level it grips the hive. The, hive, the handles are lowered around the hive, then as they lift uh, by both workers, the tabs grip the hives and raise it up. This is a very low cost accommodation uh, and provides, divides the weight in half, but it, it requires two people. The Captar hand crank or electric lift can move entire beehives or lift individual hive bodies as well. Uh, once tilted against a hive, the grip pads are raised to the desired level and squeezed together with a locking compression lever to grip the hive. The hive can then be lifted and moved uh, to a trailer or vehicle without manual lifting. Uh, the challenge is the narrow wheelbase that causes the hive to be a little unstable when moving across rough terrain, but with the addition of uh, dual wheels or attaching the captar lift to the front of a cart would, would create a very stable platform for lifting the hives. The handhold dollies are a whole hive lifts with spring-loaded tongs that slide into the hive body hand grips so like the ones we discussed before, uh, when the hand uh, dolly handle is pulled back, it lifts the hive. It's really simple to figure out. You can even mount a crane to your pickup truck or ATV to lift uh, individual hive bodies or whole hives. Uh, weight on the scissor uh, mechanism grip attachment causes them to squeeze the arms to get against the hive when lifting. Uh, when using a, a crane, you have to be careful uh, to keep the crane cable and lifting tongs directly centered over the top of the hive to prevent the hive from tipping one way or the other. Uh, dumping a whole bunch of angry bees in your lap is not the thing that you want to do at this point. Now, individuals with arthritis or carpal tunnel syndrome or hand injuries uh, may have a hard time using conventional hive tools, but by selecting specialized tools, beekeepers will be able uh, to perform these tasks easier. So moving left or right, uh, a frame grip allows a worker with weak, weak fingers but strong hands to lift the frames from the super. You squeeze it, grabbing the frame, you turn the lower knob, it holds it, you can pick it up without any additional gripping. You just use your strength to lift it from that point there. And once it's removed, you can use a removable frame holder, uh, which, is, which is attached to the side of a hive body and provides a location to, to place a removed frame during inspection. The 14 inch long giant hive tool provides a little extra leverage when working with the, uh, the hive bodies in the frames. The J hook on the end helps lift frames from the super after the pry bar has been used to break the propolis uh, seal between the frames. The chisel tool allows the wrist to remain straight uh, while uh, prying hive bodies uh, or between uh, frames. The grip ease tools 
help workers with impaired grip strength to securely hold tools. And what it does, it has a Velcro, uh, Velcro on it that holds the hand in a fist without straining muscles while using hand tools with small diameter handles that are especially difficult to hold securely. This would help when uh, either holding a capping knife or pry bar or hammer or other tools uh, that you're gonna require to use in the uh, apiary. Now getting through the beehives is a problem for all beekeepers. Uh, beehives are usually kept in open fields along tree lines or sometimes in our backyards. Uh, add in bad weather, creating obstacles and water hazards uh, make gaining access to your beehives even harder when the, with the best equipment. Regardless of their location, the majority of them are inaccessible for individuals with mobility issues. Uh, the simple solution is to make sure your hives are only set up in location easily accessible by vehicle and on smooth, flat ground. The use of all terrain vehicle makes moving to and from your apiary easier. And they can also be modified to uh, meet your needs to carry hive tools and other components as required. If your beehives are close, using a rough terrain cart with oversized tires allows you to move bulky materials easier while providing an all-terrain walker for workers with mobility challenges or poor balance. A tool wheel cart can uh, store uh, tools and supplies uh, on the lower level. The upper level can uh, serve as a mobile work table to set high bodies on during inspections. High tools can hang on pegs around the sides of a cart. Uh, a stool can even be mounted directly to the side of the cart or simply carried on the cart for your use in the field. Uh, because sitting down to inspect hives on a work platform helps prevent awkward positions while searching for the queen and doing other beekeeping uh, tasks. All necessary tools and supplies for the task uh, can be at hand to be carried on the cart, eliminating multiple trips back and forth uh, to get the correct tools. Uh, this also will help workers with poor memory in the bee yard. Placing weed cloth around hives is a low cost solution for weed control because most of us, we have bees everywhere and weeds grow anywhere they can. And, uh, but it, it may also be too soft for operating a wheelchair on. An alternative is finely crushed and firmly packed gravel that will also suppress weeds and would also provide a more firm footing to walk on. Uh, both weed control and gravel uh, will require periodic maintenance over time. Uh, using concrete pavers or installing a concrete pad uh, will provide a smooth level surface for working your beehives. Uh, although higher in cost, concrete pathways allow people with mobility impairments to conveniently travel between buildings and around hives. Concrete pathways require no additional maintenance for future use. Uh, building a hive uh, base to fit the beekeeper can help reduce the accessible, I mean, the excessive bending and lifting distances. Uh, a rolling seat or stool will allow a beekeeper to move from one position to another and an adjustment sitting position without standing up. So we've talked about the system technology. We talked about beekeeping and you think, well, maybe, you know, this is not for me. Uh, well, I kind of met these people did too at some point in time. Uh, backyard beekeeping in Florida is becoming increasingly popular with the state's honey industry and consistently ranking amongst the top five industries in the country. Assistive technology in the apiary can improve the likelihood of success for a beekeeper with, uh, with medical impairments. It's very interesting and satisfying enterprise and can generate a significant income for those that do it well. If you do not have the assistive technology and you cannot do it well, your apiary will be, apiary will be a failure. Uh, it is best to get the right tools for you to prevent that, that so that you will not start into a, a process that you're already failing on. The following video features a, a visibly impaired Jennifer Abalo from Galoob, uh, Uganda. Uh, she was, has been a beekeeper since 2013, and this is just a little snippet of the video for her and the remaining pieces in the uh, references below. So if you want to see the full video, please go there and see this. Hey, Danny, we can't hear the video.
Hey, Danny, if you wouldn't mind maybe explaining what's going on in the video since we can't hear it on our end. I'm sorry? We can't, we can't hear what's happening in the video. If you wouldn't mind just explaining very briefly what was happening there. So what she was saying is, you know, when, when she first got into the beekeeping, uh, you know, they, they kind of told her, so this, you know, you're, you, you can't see. So how are you going to be a beekeeper? Uh, but there are multiple beekeepers that are visually impaired. Uh, we even have one uh, beekeeper that I've seen a video for that's completely blind. Uh, although she's limited to the amount of things, a task that she could do inside the hive, uh, she could still use all of her other senses, uh, the sense of the feel of, or, or let me just back up, the sense of hearing uh, the hive once she walks up to the hive and be able to hear the bee activity. So she knows if they're, you know, th that the colony's kind of weak, there's nothing going really going on. If they're really, uh, you know, busy that day, bees are coming and going, or if the bee's really angry and they're just buzzing all over everything. Uh, once in the hive, she uses her sense of smell because that's what beekeepers also use uh, that when we open the hive. If, if it smells normal, we can smell the honey, we can smell the wax. It's really nice and sweet smelling. We know we're everything's going okay. But if there's an odor in there that's kind of not there, which is caused by several of the uh, different types of diseases we can have in our hives, if there's a, a, a different smell other than that, then we know that there's something wrong. And that lady did the same thing. He could open the hive, smell it, and say, okay, well, everything's good or everything's bad. And then she uses her sense of touch to actually kind of feel the bees moving around the box, knowing where they're located within the box. If they're the frame, everything's completely full. If they're only on one or two frames, so she could tell the, the strength of the hives just from touch. And that's what this lady here, uh, Jennifer, was saying as, as well. When she received her training, she started with a simple uh, beehive. It was in a log, which is a lot of the uh, uh, the over in the uh, uh, put their bees in the logs, close one end up, and they use the other floor, and they send their uh, bees up in trees. Started with a very simple beehive, uh, and then has has expanded since then to a normal uh, to amount of sixteen. So she's just saying, well, if more or less, if, you know, when they first started, they made fun of me, but I showed them because I actually am a beekeeper and I am being a success for that. Does that kind of cover it? Yeah, that's great, Danny. Feel free to feel free to move on. Okay. All right. So again, uh, as I was saying before, these are the list of references. That video is in the bottom. You'll see, you'll get this at, as well with the uh, as a packet, uh, please go see this. You know, look at all the the people that are has disabilities that are in beekeeping. So if you think that I can't do something, there's always a way for you to do it. And use of assistive technology and resources that we can help you to get in touch with will actually make you a good productive beekeeping. So at this time, uh, I will return the presentation uh, back to Shelby. Thanks, Danny. Um, I want to say a quick thank you so much to um, both Lindsay and Danny. Um, you guys did a great job today. And we are going to go ahead and send out a quick evaluation. If you um, will go ahead and fill that out for us, we are going to take the next three minutes to make that happen. And then we're going to have a question and answer session with Lindsay and Danny. So like I said, take a few moments to do that um, and then we'll come back together.
Okay, we'll give you about one more minute to do that poll and then we'll come back together. Thank you to those who have already filled it out. Okay, it looks like you guys are quicker than me. 100% of you have filled it out. I really appreciate that. Um, and now we will go ahead and move into the question and answer portion of the webinar. I don't see any questions in our Q&A box. So um, I'd like to open the floor and the chat box for any questions. Feel free um, to unmute yourself and ask a question of Danny and Lindsay. Um, Danny, someone asked in the question in the Q and A, are there any building plans for accessible hives? There are. Are you talking about building plans where they can build them themselves? You said yes. Okay. Uh, there are different vendors that are making boxes. There are different things that we could uh, look at. The horizontal hive that we use during the presentation, there is a gentleman that makes them out of North Carolina. Uh, Justin Ruger has one in his beehive. You can go to his site and see it. Uh, I don't know if we could get the uh, blueprints to those and make those. Uh, but they're easy enough to do. I mean, we could look around and get to the hives. Just, uh, you have my email, please email me and then I will find you what you need and then see if I could get you the right stuff. Okay, and we have a question in the chat. Are there any programs for backyard beekeepers getting started? The startup cost is high. It is relatively high, but there's, there's ways to mitigate that cost. Uh, you know, you don't need to go through, and I always tell my wife every time we would go into a, uh, a cooking store, you don't need every pot and pan because we only use one or two out of the 50 that we have. So the best place to start is to go into a local uh, beekeeping association in your area if they, each county has one or if there's not one in your county there's one close enough to you uh, University of Florida uh, the beekeeping college has links for those or again if uh, you can't find that, that information email me and I will get you to the right places um, those are the best places to go to it's free of cost to, to, to go and attend if we do have membership fees it's very low but you, you gain so much information from the local associations and you can get uh, mentors that live close to you. And will and they also link you in with the providers of a beekeeping equipment and the bees that you're gonna actually buy and install in your hives. So they're all local resource, all local where you could reach out when you have questions. Uh, so those are the best places to start. As far as cost, yeah, it's, you buy a whole hive and just put it in your yard. You just you don't want to go through the process of building them up or anything. A whole hive costs about three hundred fifty dollars, but you get all new equipment that's going to last you years and good bees. And then you just could immediately go into beekeeping and and possibly process honey for the first year. Uh, we always recommend beekeepers start out smaller. Uh, you know, and you could get uh, nukes or a small five frame uh, cells a five frame box that you install into your cam or a 10 or eight frame box uh, for $150. So it's then you just let them grow. But that first year, only thing do, the bees are doing is growing and you do not expect to pull any honey at all. That, I think I, that I hope that answered the question or if not, then uh, Please let me know if there's any follow on and then I will go to those as well. Sure, thanks Justin for sharing that paper on accessible beekeeping in the chat. Um, we have another question from Mary. Any recommendations for beekeepers in urban areas who may have hives on rooftops? 
thinking of difficulty of carrying heavy hive boxes up and down stairs to get to the roof. Uh, that's an, uh, something that uh, I've, I've never had to work with. Uh, I've thought about it. There is a lady in South Florida that uh, has beehives and she leases out to different uh, businesses and she puts them on the rooftops. Uh, I would look at the business to see if they uh, have a maybe a lift that they moved equipment up and down into the, uh, the, the uh, rooftops. Uh, if not, you know, once you've, uh, if you just get somebody to get the bees to the rooftop, you know, you're carrying them up either through the elevators or through the uh, stairway access, getting them up there, then it's a lot easier for you because most roofs are pretty flat and, and you don't have the mobility issues that we have you know, traveling across the yards or across fields. Um, so I don't know much about you putting them on rooftops, uh, you know, other than using either a uh, kind of like uh, like window cleaners, the, the things that they use, or maybe a, a, a type of lift to get them up there so that you don't have to kind of attach them and, and drag them up by rope. I'd have to look into that, but again, send me an email and I will research this information. And if you need help to reaching out to your the, the business where you want to put them on, uh, we will work with them as well to find out the easiest way to get that in place for you. Thanks, Danny. Um, as you'll see in the chat, we dropped those resources. You can find their email contact information and a downloadable handout. Um, we've also put the dates for the B College. We will have some participation um, in the B College this year. We just don't have the dates and time. So be on the lookout for that. Um, do you have any more questions for Lindsay and Danny before we hop off today? I, I would like to say the, um, the B College will be a lot more informative as far as uh, more in depth on the beekeeping side and the biology side and actually working hives. This webinar is very just preemptive leading up to the bee college to give you a very general overview of floor agribility and the beekeeping side. But bee college is just that. It is bee college. It is different breakout sessions with different professionals and we play a very small part in that. So if you are interested in getting involved in beekeeping and then if you know anyone that can be enrolled with, enrolled in agribility, please you know reach out to us and enroll in the B College because it's going to be extremely um, informative. All right. Okay, we have one more question. Um, any updates for the Hives to Heroes and the Heroes to Hives programs? You have to go to those individual sites to uh, to log in. I think the hives or the heroes to hives program uh, has already started their enrollment. I don't know if it has expired, uh, but the heroes to hives out of Texas, you could go over and, and to submit uh, for to be a newbie and to be able to uh, work through them. Uh, at any time, uh, and then we'll find a local beekeeper in your area. They're very specific and have requirements on mentors. So anybody they assign to you is going to be uh, high quality. So I would recommend to go with them uh, and because they also help support uh, re repayment of the uh, Master Bee College or Master Beekeeper Program to the University of, uh, of Alabama. I'm, I'm sorry, University of Florida. Uh, uh, if you successfully pass it, they will refund you for that. They will help you get your equipment and other things like that as well. So the Heroes for Hives, not sure, but Hives for Heroes, ongoing anytime. Thank you, Danny. Any other last questions? I'll give it another second just in case somebody out there is typing. Uh, 
Okay. Well, I, again, would like to thank Lindsay and Danny so much for taking the time to um, present to us today. And as for everyone who attended our webinar, thank you so much. Um, we hope that you were able to gain some information from um, some new information from our speakers today. And we, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to go follow us on our social media outlets, the Florida Agribility um, and please keep up with us on our website and look for future webinars. We, um, we plan to host more like this one um, on different topics within the agricultural industry. Thanks so much and um, have a great day.